This is uh, one of my favourite conferences, so it's a treat to be talking to you all. I'm also acutely aware of the fact that I'm keeping you from the bar, so I thank you for your attention, but if you need to leave, I'll understand. Um, so yeah, today I want to talk about um, a journal uh, that um, has been running for about three years called the Journal of Open Source Software. Um, it should have been pointed out to be by... Uh, one of the editors in this room, Dan Katz, that I'm actually missing an editor. That's because we're currently on an editorial drive. And so I added an editor about three hours ago, and I forgot to add her here. Her name is Katie Barnhart. She works at the University of Colorado. And she's awesome, but she's not in this list, so I apologize to her. Um, but before I uh, forget, I also want to say thanks to people who supported us uh, with Joss. So um, the last but not least on the right here is the R Open Sci, which is a very nice project that um, uh, tries to uh, cultivate high-quality research packages in the R programming languages for open science. And actually, Joss uh, actually leverages a lot of the review mechanisms that they came up with for onboarding software into their community. And we're also affiliated with the Open Source Initiative and Num Focus, and we've had financial support from the Sloan Foundation and uh, the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation. So, um, you know, Joss wouldn't be possible without the help of these uh, organizations or, with, or without the support of editors and, and reviewers. So why does JOS exist? Well, it, it exists because software is important. Um, software is important to our research. Um, and there's lots of evidence for this. There's been surveys of uh, 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 scientists and academics where people report numbers upwards of 90% of people say that software is either important or very important to their work and, and you know, would not be possible without software. Um, obviously, software is heavily mentioned in the literature. There were some uh, nice slides at the breakout yesterday, uh, the hack day, from uh, Roberto de Cosmo talking about, um, you know, there's been surveys of the literature in science and nature where um, people find that uh, papers that are published there these days, you know, a large fraction of those mention software a lot, uh, often many, many different research packages. So. It's really, really a critical part of what we do, and it's also everywhere. Um, it's in every part of the scholarly uh, 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 um, research cycle. And um, the quote I like to try and kind of capture this is from uh, uh, one of the founders of uh, the Scikit-Learn project, which is very popular in data science, uh, Gail Varco, says, you know, software turns uh, a theoretical model into quantitative predictions, controls an experiment, and extracts from raw data evidence supporting or rejecting a theory. I think this is a really lovely way of just kind of expressing the range of areas where software has impact in research. And so in my day job, uh, where we help astronomers do uh, science with data from NASA missions, you know, people write things like Jupyter notebooks to find exoplanets. Uh, but in previous lives, I worked in bioinformatics. And you know, the latest and sort of greatest uh, genomic sequencing now is USB powered, apparently, and, and you know, is incredibly cheap. You know, software is at the heart of this, um, both you know, experimental science, but also things like the Millennium Simulation. This is one of the largest simulations of the universe done in astrophysics. You know, software is just a core part of both generating data, um, but also, you know, uh, resulting analyses. And the thing about this is that the software being everywhere is not is not a, just a statement about academia, of course. Um, you know, if you wanted to uh, buy uh, one of these machines, for example, you know, John Deere now considers itself a software company. You know, the, the most sensitive intellectual property in this piece of hardware is the software that drives the machine and allows it to uh, operate efficiently, not the hardware that uh, you might expect them uh, to think was the sort of uh, uh, the, the most important part of what they do. And so, you know, partly this is kind of influenced by my time at GitHub, but, uh, uh, you know, what, what we're seeing across, you know, industry and academia across every sector is that uh, software is eating the world. This is a phrase that uh, Mark Andreessen uh, actually uh, defined. There's a really excellent article about this, There's a lot about open source software, um, but it's, uh, it's, it really is true. Um, unfortunately for, for, uh, for us all, um, the, the people who get really good at writing software uh, are very employable outside of academia. And this, uh, this is by Jake Vanderplas, who uh, used to be at UW and uh, somewhat ironically now is at Google. Uh, he's an incredible software engineer, and thankfully he's still sort of building tools for academia. He works on the Google Collaboratory project, amongst other things. But, you know, Jake, um, Jake is now at Google, and I think, you know, part of the challenge is that people that have uh, 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 invested time and effort in in developing software is that they can often have a uh, less than optimal research career. And the crux of this is because um, 
it's not you know completely trivial to uh, uh, find a way to get career credit for writing research software. And Phil Bourne, who was at the NIH and uh, who's at uh, University of Virginia now, uh, phrased this nicely. Uh, you know, we need to find a way to legitimize software as a form of scholarship. And so why isn't software a creditable research activity? Well, here are some uh, example reasons. Uh, this is my only slide with obligatory source code in the background because this is a software talk. Um, as you can see, I've sort of categorized a few answers here. Some of these are technical reasons. Some of them are purely uh, cultural, just things that we don't do. But, and this depends, of course, between communities and different journals and publishing systems. But, you know, there are challenges around citation. Um, also, you know, things that uh, what can actually turn up in the references of a paper, for example. Uh, whether even if you did mention software, whether that would be indexed. Um, there are some really interesting um, questions around what does it mean to have software in the in uh, the scholarly ecosystem if it isn't necessarily peer reviewed. We like peer review uh, uh, generally, and uh, you know there's also some uh, potential challenges about having software using other software and and what that citation graph uh, looks like. And so there are generally sort of two categories. Uh, uh, of sort of activities that people think about, about how to recognize, better recognize software contributions. And these generally fall into, uh, into, two, into two categories. The first is to find some way to sort of fit software that's been created today um, by researchers into the existing system that we have. So, and you know, the system that we have is, is, has been built for, uh, uh, you know, papers, books, that kind of thing. Uh, and the other is to evolve our credit model, which is generally built around papers and citations to those, evolve beyond that. And so one of the great things about being at FORCE is uh, actually this is something that FORCE has uh, been incredibly active in. And so on this first one, um, you know, there's been a lot of work uh, over the last few years, last four or five years now, about developing mechanisms, well, actually some founding principles for software citation uh, uh, that were an extension of the data citation principles. Um, but also thinking about how they can be implemented. And there's actually a working group uh, led by Dan Katz and uh, Neil Chu Hong uh, that's uh, active right now that's working. Oh, and Martin Fenner as well. Yeah, sorry, I'm going to get everybody in the room. Um, uh, that's uh, that's uh, working on implementation uh, of these principles right now. So, you know, if, you, if, you, if we were to see this kind of adoption in uh, the wider um, ecosystem of journals, then, you know, provided that people were uh, doing this, you know, if you can make your software citable as an author, so maybe that means putting a DOI on it, archiving it somewhere, um, make it easy for people to do the right thing and cite you, um, then if we did some work to sort of lobby and lean on, encourage people who index uh, the literature to count these citations, then we'd, then we'd be probably in a pretty good shape. Um, of course, it's probably just worth pausing slightly just to remember why we cite things. I think, you know, there are lots of reasons that we cite, um, but I think that we really think mostly about uh, credit and uh, it's the most sort of direct way we have as uh, uh, individuals of sort of rewarding people for uh, their efforts. Um, and so, you know, the, the, the credit model is, is, is obviously a critical part of, of what we work. And it turns out that, you know, evolving that, so this is the sort of other way that we could think about this, uh, going beyond this one dimensional credit model, um, is 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 kind of hard. Um, so one approach, and actually um, you should uh, talk to Dan Katz about this, he's here, uh, is this idea called transitive credit. And I thought I'd just mention this briefly. Um, the idea is that uh, if you had, um, you know, a paper uh, written by myself, um, you start to uh, break down um, the different parts of the research, whatever you use to go into that result, you break down into different types of citations. So you are citing previous research. I'm probably going to cite myself, my last paper or something. I'm going to cite some other people as well. But then I'd also cite the data sets that I made use of. So these are some uh, cosmology missions. And then I would also cite uh, uh, um, the, uh, the software that I used. And the idea about um, uh, this transitive credit idea is that you cite all of the all of the items in this list, and then you award some kind of credit score across across these different things. So, how much of my sort of uh, uh, credit impact that I can award? How much of it goes to each of these things? Um, and of course, because each of these things in this in this list also can have a, a credit map, then then it's a transitive property. So, you know, maybe the AstroPy project uh, cites a paper about it, but also the core libraries such as NumPy and SciPy that, that it uses. So this is just an idea. 
Uh, there were lots of challenges in implementing something like this. And it turns out that, you know, evolving beyond uh, one-dimensional credit model uh, is, is really hard. So, um, you know, both technically hard because of, uh, uh, um, uh, you know, the slide I was just showing, but also because of the different changes that are needed across the community. And so, you know, changes uh, for, for a different type of uh, a credit model require individual changes, both in how individuals behave as authors, reviewers, editors. Uh, it requires changes at the group and community level, editorial teams, publishers, but also wider ecosystem changes, uh, you know, journals, publishers, indexes. So... Joss was born out of um, uh, this idea that really there's an existing thing that people do to get around all of these problems. And that is that people just write papers about software. And at the time, I was actually working uh, on the software citation principles. I sort of had two, two halves of my brain I think I need to feed. This is sort of what's the perfect way to fix this problem? And then what's the simplest thing we can do that would work as well? And so, um, so software papers are kind of interesting because... They give us something really easy to cite. We know what papers are. We know how to cite them. Um, they don't require any changes to the existing infrastructure. And, um, you know, there's actually some really nice consequences of, of uh, writing software papers, especially if you're, you know, a journal in your field already accepts uh, papers um, about software, it, then it's probably the best place uh, in your community to actually advertise your software. It's in the, it's in the journal that's already being read uh, by your community. But there are some challenges with software papers. Um, firstly is that, you know, writing papers is real work. And if you're already writing lots of, uh, spending lots of time writing um, uh, uh, software, then, you know, writing a paper on top of that is a, is a major, major uh, uh, effort. Um, also, many journals don't accept papers about software. And so this is uh, obviously a challenge. If you wanted to put a uh, paper into your, into your favorite society journal or something, then you, you, you um, maybe wouldn't have a, a very good reception there. Um, there's also some major challenges with uh, the sort of dynamic nature of software, especially long-lived software packages, things that actually have a long lifetime, go through many releases. Authorship is, is, uh, is rarely static uh, for these long-lived packages. So, you know, people become contributors, move off the project, uh, new people join. So a paper with a sort of static author list is, is, uh, presents some major challenges. Um, and then so, but then maybe you'd have mo lots of software papers over the years, and uh, now we start to worry about things like citation dilution and um, uh, weird things like that. And so, you know, software papers have their problems too. Um, I would also point out that, you know, some journals have incredibly enlightened in this. So um, uh, all my examples today come from astronomy because that's where I uh, spend most of my time. And actually, AAS Publishing has, a, I would say, a very enlightened uh, uh, attitude to software papers. This is their policy on, on publishing software papers in any of the AAS journals. So that's like the Astrophysical Journal, uh, AppJ Letters, that kind of thing. There's, uh, they don't require novel results. They uh, no minimum length, and uh, and uh, it's a it's a good experience for authors. So Josh was born out of this idea, though, what, about what if we really just embraced what really is a hack, which is um, this idea of publishing software papers. What if we made it as easy as possible to write a software paper? Um, in fact, for really high quality software, what if we made it something that took no more than about an hour? Uh, many of these packages that get published with us already have high quality documentation. They have, uh, you know, very well written readmes on GitHub. What if we could effectively encourage somebody to take subsets of the readme of their journal and just put it in and uh, publish that as a paper? And the primary purpose of establishing JOS is to enable citation credit for authors of research software. There are lots, lots of other good reasons and lots of things we care about too, but this was the, 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 primary, the primary goal of setting up the journal. So just very briefly, our papers are pretty short. They're generally under two pages. Um, we want people to describe in very high level terms what the software does, but we want that for a, a, a diverse non-specialist audience. Um, we want people to describe the, 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 the sort of research purpose, what's the need uh, that the, they're meeting. Uh, obviously, standard things like acknowledgements of financial support, references to existing work, um, but we explicitly don't allow people to publish results. Um, so that's, uh, those can go somewhere else. 
Um, and when we were setting up the journal, we had some goals, um, you know, be as conventional as possible uh, when integrating the Scholarly ecosystem. So we use ORCIDs for login. Uh, we deposit uh, metadata with uh, an issue our uh, DOIs through Crossref. We archive the papers and actually the reviews with Portico. Uh, the software, because most of it lives in a repository that wouldn't be considered archival, we uh, insist that the authors also uh, deposit software with uh, with uh, somewhere that will give uh, you know permanent archive. So that's you know Dryad, Figshare, Zenodo, and we've also been working very hard to get indexed by uh, folks like Google Scholar, Scopus, that kind of thing. Um, another important goal was just to follow best practices where they exist, not try and rent the wheel. So uh, we wanted to be open access, uh, CC BY, where the authors retain copyright. Um, as members of the open source initiative, it's very important for us to um, enforce the open source definition. So that means only allowing open source packages that use an official open source license. You're not allowed to publish in JOS if you've written your own open, open source license. Come and talk to me later if you are thinking about doing that. That's a bad idea. Um, uh, we wanted to have clear ethics, ownership, business model, and government, governance statements. But we also wanted to have a really good peer review process that was uh, explicit what we were va judging the software on and, and, and that was transparent to everyone. And so that means, you know, registering with community directories uh, too. Um, and also it was really important to us that we had, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a useful service for authors. And so, you know, that means not asking people to write a long paper. We genu genuinely believe that the documentation, if you want to use the software, you should probably be reading the documentation. The, the paper here in JOS is really just uh, advertising for, for the software. Um, we wanted to give a you know, constructive peer review process from community experts that would help people um, build uh, expertise themselves uh, as authors. And we had no real goals to reject submissions. Uh, we wanted to focus on helping people improve the quality of their software. So uh, we have papers that are, have been under review for two years that are still creeping towards acceptance. Um, you know, we, we also wanted to, as I said before, the review criteria to be transparent, people to know what was going to, what to expect, but also actually look at the software. If, uh, I've done a, a sort of a, a straw poll a few times on Twitter and talked to people who publish software papers in journals uh, and asked if the, ed if the reviewers ever gave them any feedback on the software. And uh, the answer is almost universally no. So software papers generally, are, they're serving a purpose in terms of credit, but they're not actually looking at the software. And we, we really wanted the focus of the review to be on the software. And we thought it was pretty realistic to basically offer a free service to uh, authors and to um, uh, readers. And so uh, finally, the last kind of goal was to leverage the best parts of open source where possible. And so that meant carrying out reviews in a familiar environment, so in a kind of a, like a software review environment, so that's on GitHub for us. Um, we wanted to be, you know, collaborative, sort of conversational style, be welcoming, um, and be transparent about our editorial decision-making processes, but lab leverage all the good, uh, the great tools that are out there, like Pandoc for for paper preparation, as well, and also automation turns out to be a big part of what we do, and I'll talk about that in a minute. So I thought I'd just show you what the review process looks like. Um, there's a kind of schematic here, which is probably not very helpful. So I thought I'd just show you the kind of flow from the, the, the journal website. So this is what the website looks like. Um, this is a uh, um, screenshot from yesterday, I guess. Submission is pretty simple. Uh, people just uh, give us a little bit of metadata. They tell us uh, where the software is online. We let people suggest an editor. Um, if they uh, have a preference based on topic, uh, and we ask for a short description, um, and you know we ask people to uh, uh, um, say that they're an author and that they'll uh, adhere to the con code of conduct. Um, after people click submit here, very quickly after that, the software shows up on GitHub. So we have a review issue. We call this the pre-review issue. This is kind of like where. Uh, we, uh, so this is the author here. This is where we find the editor, where we find the reviewers, and where we basically make sure everything's working in terms of the paperwork and compiles um, before the review starts. And so the first thing that happens when a uh, review starts is that um, uh, 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 we have a robot called Whedon that introduces themselves to uh, the author and uh, immediately tells everybody that they are a robot, although this is uh, sometimes uh, not noticed by people, so that can lead to quite hilarious interactions. Um, 
Uh, so we have our editorial robot um, that does things like tries to compile the paper. This is using Pandoc. Also does things like tries to uh, identify what uh, kind of programming language the software is written in. And then, uh, so what's happening here is our managing editor, uh, Kyle Nima, is uh, asking, uh, asking a couple of our editors if they, can, um, if they will edit this submission. And so uh, Lorena here volunteers. Uh, and uh, and I, this is the author here suggesting some people who could potentially review the submission. Uh, there's a little bit of a delay as our uh, editor um, assigns assigns the uh, editor here. So this is, again, asking the robot to uh, do some assignments. So this just updates some metadata on our side. Um, and, then, and then, you know, here we have a couple of reviewers saying that they're uh, willing to, uh, willing to uh, uh, review the submission. And then the... Uh, uh, I think uh, the last step here is, yeah, so here's the uh, editor assigning the reviewers. And before, before Lorena starts this paper, she's actually checking, um, checking the references. So this is actually just parsing the, the bib tech uh, that goes with the paper to look for missing DOIs, because one thing we want to do is create really good metadata at the end of the review. So uh, this is Whedon knows how to uh, look for missing DOIs for papers. Uh, and then Lorena asks uh, Whedon to start the review. Uh, which basically opens another issue uh, on GitHub. So let's go to that. So this is now the same the same uh, author here, but now we have the editor and the reviewers assigned. And now what we have is a slightly longer form uh, issue where uh, each each uh, reviewer now has a checklist. And I mentioned our open site at the start. This checklist is is um, a lot of these checks actually come from the our open site community. These are you can think of these as like health checks uh, uh, for the quality and the sort of uh, standard of the software, how well it's being uh, 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 documented, and 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 uh, you know, is it uh, is it a, a approachable, usable piece of software? And so, uh, these checklists. There's a checklist for each uh, reviewer, and people work through that. And you can see here, a reviewer is opening uh, issues on on the actual software repository and cross-linking them so that they show up here. Uh, and so this, you know, can take days or uh, weeks sometimes, but often it's uh, uh, pretty quick. And uh, it looks like the uh, um, uh, author was asked to make some updates to the paper. So here's the uh, author asking Whedon to regenerate a preview of the of the paper. And then we're getting pretty close to the end now. So uh, we we ask authors to uh, create a version of the software that's been reviewed when it's when all the changes have been made. And so, uh, so that's happening here. And then the, um, uh, the author is actually also making now an archive of the software with Zenodo, and we associate that with the, uh, with the submission too. And then the last step for an editor is to, associate, uh, to uh, tag the uh, associate editors in chief uh, to ask them to accept it. So here's a, actually a different Lorena. We have two Lorenas at Joss, um, who is uh, now doing a kind of pre-flight uh, sort of a dummy attempt to accept the paper. So this kind of produces a final proof of the paper, also produces all the cross-ref metadata. Um, um, so, you know, you can eyeball that. And then uh, the last uh, step is actually for Lorena to say, actually do this for real. And so uh, that's uh, passing this flag. And then, sure enough, um, the uh, paper is accepted. Whedon loves Twitter and emoji, so tweets the paper, and uh, uh, and then shouts at everybody to say this is, really has happened. This has just been published, and you know sometimes it doesn't work, so you have to check. So you know this is this, you have to go and check that the DOI actually resolves. Uh, but I would say out of the last three or four hundred papers that we published, I would say more than three hundred ninety, probably ninety nine percent of papers. This works, so it's pretty reliable. And then the issue is closed, and when the issue is closed, then on closing that, uh, um, uh, some of you may have seen this sort of convention of putting badges in GitHub readmes. You can do that. Uh, you'll see them for Zenodo a lot online. Um, and so uh, Whedon gives the authors a badge that they can put in, put in their readme to uh, explain, explain uh, where to find the paper. And then, of course, a part of that, uh, the paper is also then visible up on uh, on the uh, journal website. So that's kind of what it looks like. So at the heart of this, if you haven't noticed, is we have this bot. Uh, uh, it's called Whedon. Um, if you'd like me to explain why it's called Whedon, I can later. Um, no, good. OK, most of you know, but some people don't. And you should explain to them later why. Um, 
It turns out that Whedon as a username was available on GitHub when we were starting this project, so uh, we snagged that. And Whedon is the spot that um, basically sits between um, a relatively simple website that runs on, uh, up on Heroku, which is just a place to run web applications. Uh, obviously, GitHub is in the loop here. Uh, and uh, so Whedon sort of coordinates between, between the website and GitHub, but also has these uh, superpowers to uh, you know, uh, deposit metadata with Crossref uh, um, uh, and uh, um, you know, deposit with uh, arch uh, archive papers with Portico, that kind of thing. Um, and honestly, I think Whedon is probably the most important thing about Joss. Um, this is the most important thing that we've built, uh, aside from establishing, obviously, an amazing editorial team. Uh, this is the kind of thing that, uh, that sort of greases the wheel for us. This is a thing that makes um, uh, uh, working uh, at scale on GitHub uh, uh, relatively straightforward. So these are, these are, this is just an extract of our documentation. I thought I'd just show you some of the commands. Uh, so, you know, these are things that people can say in the GitHub issue to, uh, to Whedon. And and uh, Whedon responds with you know uh, with you know either sorry you can't do that so authors can't accept their own papers in case you're wondering um, uh, but you know um, they also can't assign reviewers that kind of thing but the idea is that these are the these are the sort of commands that are available and then some of these editorial ones at the end um, um, you know can set reminders check references accept papers that kind of thing um, we have published a paper about. Joss, um, not in Joss, I guess. Well, it's probably worth observing, but <laughs> we published it in PJ, which talks a lot more about uh, Joss. If you'd like to know, uh, this was a summary of our uh, first uh, first year um, activities, and it, it, these are some stats. I, I'm sorry, I don't have up to date ones, but these are from the first year. I have no reason to think that much has changed. To be perfectly honest, the submissions to Joss are dominated by languages that have traction in the sort of uh, in academia. So. Uh, Python and R are very big, uh, 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 um, very popular. Um, we are pretty heavily skewed towards uh, US and Europe submissions, although we are actively working on expanding the uh, geographical diversity of our editorial board right now, and uh, that's a very big focus for us right now. Um, and this is the growth in submissions of just the first year. Uh, so we published about 100 papers in our first year, and um, if you like trends, uh, this is what it looks like now, and so we're up to uh, we're publishing about thirty papers a month right now. And uh, just to scare myself, I did this, and so I don't know if you've seen this XKCD. It's one of my favourite ones. Um, that if you extrapolate, and maybe you can't, but if you do, then uh, we're going to hit about a thousand papers in uh, June next year, and we'll be publishing something like five hundred papers per month in. Uh, uh, sometime in 2021, but it's kind of pretty, well, to my astronomer eyes, that's an incredibly good fit. I don't know how it looks uh, to you. Um, so we've been also trying to write about uh, a little bit about our experiences with Joss, and so uh, there's a couple of blog posts um, uh, that that I wanted to run through you uh, with you here, um, and that this is really sort of to uh, uh, give um, you fodder to shout at me later in the bar, really, uh, to talk about what it might cost to um, uh, run a journal uh, in this way, and so these are the fixed costs that we actually pay. Um, so we, you know, we're members of Crossref. Uh, uh, we pay money for DOIs. Uh, we run a small website, the Joss website, on um, on Heroku. Uh, we have a domain name that we have to maintain. Uh, we uh, are at the lowest tier, I think, uh, for Portico and for Crossref actually. So we, you know, we have a sort of a fixed cost of about a thousand dollars per year. And so if we assume that we publish about 300 papers per year, which is actually a bit low now, then we're coming out something like $3 per paper. Again, um, I'm sure you don't like these numbers, some of you, and come and shout at me later. So here's a maybe a better number. Um, what if we think about costs that we currently don't pay? So um, there are things that we do, like um, you know, NumFocus as an organization, uh, we have some access to legal support from them if we need it. Um, they um, run a bank account for us, so we have financial services through them. Um, so you know, you, there are things that you can you can add in which uh, um, would increase the costs. Um, we could pay our editors. Um, we could pay our reviewers. Um, they haven't factored that in here, but if we assumed some rate and paid some editors, we can easily get ourselves up to about thirteen hundred dollars per paper. But 
you know, I, I mean, I, I think um, it was Dan who did a lot of the research for this post. You know, it's incredibly hard to find out how much journals pay people. And there's probably a good reason for that, because nobody wants to actually know. Uh, that, um, people want to know what other people are paying, but nobody wants uh, you to know what you're paying. Uh, so, so, you know, it's very hard to know what these numbers look like. So really, maybe let's get slightly more realistic. This is our kind of best guess, actually, that if we, that if we did have a modest stipend here and there, and um, uh, we, we um, you know, did what we think most other journals are actually doing, then we think we come out at something like 100 dollars per paper. And so if we gave ourselves some kind of uh, healthy profit margin of 30%, that gets us to about 130 bucks per paper. Okay, so I said, so that's kind of how Just works, how uh, all the stuff under the hood. Um, I said at the start that this was about a collaborative open source meeting peer review. So um, I want to spend some time talking about um, um, what we're doing with Joss and how we're kind of leveraging open source conventions and uh, and 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 kind of try and just draw some similarities and parallels there. And so, as I say, when we started Joss, we were really thinking about how stuff happens in open source, how stuff happens in open source communities. And one of the really things, important things to realize about open source and the sort of change that's happened in the last decade is that really open source is is a license, right? Open source is about uh, the right to use, modify, share software under understood terms, but it's not. There's nothing about a right to contribute in open source, and that sounds strange because actually a lot of projects these days, a lot of the most successful open source projects, are actually open collaborations. And so Carl Fogel, who literally wrote the book about producing open source software, he's uh, it was heavily involved uh, in a project uh, called Subversion, version control system that many of you will use. Uh, he runs a, a consultancy in Chicago these days. He, he defined this term open collaborations, which I think is rather nice, a highly collaborative development process um, receptive to contributions of code, documentation, discussions from anyone who shows competent interest. And so really the transition from open source being about uh, just, you know, a permissions thing to a uh, uh, to an open collaboration, I think in large part was stimulated by uh, GitHub and GitHub's about 10 years old now. Uh, this is their old logo. And because I don't work there anymore, I can use it. Uh, I would not be allowed to use the old logo. They started with this tagline of social coding. They brought social to open source. And so, you know, on something like uh, uh, the Whedon uh, code base on GitHub, you know, you can click the button. This button is the open source piece. I can take a copy of your code. This is the license bit. Um, but the thing about uh, the sort of social part of that was that pull requests, which are this way of um, uh, forking the code, making your changes, and then um, trying to uh, contribute them back later, um, have this model where you fork the code and then you make your changes. You haven't asked anybody if you can. Maybe you discuss those changes and then um, you advocate, try and get them merged in later. So it delays the permission of the contribution to later. And so really a Joss review is, 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 is emulating this kind of pull request flow. And so if you, know, if you look at a really big open source project that's doing this well, and uh, uh, one I like is uh, AstroPy, which is very popular in astronomy. And this is the AstroPy project on GitHub. These are all pull requests, and they currently uh, have 68 open, but have you know, closed uh, close to 5,000. So some of those will have been merged in, some of them won't. Um, over the last few years, they've had about 5,000 contributions in this way. These are all uh, contributions, uh, pending contributions to this project. And, you know, there's something like a thousand forks of this project. And so pull requests look a lot like peer review to me. They are peer review of software. So this is coming from somebody else's software there. Uh, um, I think uh, improving some error handling here uh, in the code base. And so this is the uh, author talking here. And here's some people reviewing and looking at the code and leaving comments. Uh, and this is, you know, this is a, here are some changes being added based on feedback. And, you know, ultimately we get to, uh, uh, this is merged, so this is a successful contribution to this project. But this is, uh, you know, this is this is kind of peer review in action in software. And actually, if you look at um, uh, GitHub every year, publishes its reports on uh, they call it the state of the octaverse. So how what happened on GitHub last year? This is the last report. So there have now been something like 200 million pull requests on GitHub uh, in the last decade. Uh, and about a third of those were in the last 12 months. 
And so I, I think by my understanding, there's something like 2 million academic articles published per year. Um, presumably lots of those get peer reviewed. Um, uh, you know, there's, there's definitely more peer review happening in open source than there is in academia. I think GitHub's the biggest peer review platform on the planet. So one of the things about this sort of collaborative open source thing is that there's a lot of uh, focus in this new model in how to build a project that's receptive to contributions of code, documentation, discussion, that kind of thing. And actually, a lot of the really important changes that were made in this space were by um, uh, the Node.js project. Uh, and some of you might know about this. They have this idea of kind of really open, they, I think they call it open open source. And the idea is they do, they do incredibly interesting things like uh, if you get a single commit into the code base, then you're made a maintainer. Not like you have work to do, but you have commit rights. They, they liberal contribution policies. They say if you contributed, you're, you, you're, you know, you're part of the, you're part of the project. And um, there's a really nice article by uh, Michael Rogers, who uh, is one of the people who was very early in the uh, NPM and the Node community, uh, where he writes about this. And he talks about the, the sort of key ideas behind uh, open, collaborative or really open source. And, and it's, you know, create users through education, uh, encourage users to contribute. And this is this liberal con contributor policy that I just mentioned. And, and they're very open about their governance. Um, there's another uh, uh, community that is kind of doing a similar thing. Many of you will have Homebrew installed on your Mac. So this is a way of getting packages installed. Uh, it's, uh, the key core maintainer is a guy called Mike McQuaid, who's actually uh, lives in Edinburgh. And he has this thing that he calls the open source contributor funnel, where you're trying to turn users into con contributors and ultimately maybe some of those maintainers. But this is because one of the key challenges of open source is actually sustaining projects through uh, maintainers. So in many ways, you know, maintainers are kind of like editors of, of journals. So, you know, projects like AstroPy are not only uh, uh, doing peer review of contributions, but they're also doing things like this is a project where people talk about changes the project should make to itself. So they call these, uh, this is modeled on how Python does this. They talk about proposals for, I think, you know, we should do this part of what we do in this, in this fundamentally different way. And they, and they have discussions about that. The whole, the decision-making process of the project is open. Um, another pattern that you see, again, is, is actually uh, this thing, and there's a thing going on right now called, uh, um, that some of you might know, called Hacktoberfest, uh, which is uh, uh, run by uh, DigitalOcean. And the idea here is that people uh, label issues that are designed, uh, that are really suitable for new contributors to open source. So maybe they're really simple fixes where people already know how to fix it, but the maintainers have left it open as a, somebody should fix this, and this is how you do it. And they'll label it as good first issue or package novice or Hacktoberfest. And, uh, and actually, if you get, I think, four of these merged, uh, uh, you get a t-shirt. Um, so that's kind of cool. Um, and so I don't, I don't have fully formed thoughts on what I'm about to say right now, but I just want to kind of just speculate on this. I think, you know, one of the things we're trying to do with Joss is we're trying to build a community where people care about software, care about uh, 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 helping each other improve. And a lot of that is, you know, we're trying to model that a lot on how, how uh, you know, successful uh, big open source projects look, uh, look like. And so if we have a contributor flow, then maybe it's, you know, reviewers, authors, editors. Definitely uh, some of our uh, authors have become editors. Some of our best reviewers become editors. So actually maybe it's like this. Um, but, you know, the journal is sustained by, you know, the, 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 you know, open source is sustained by contributors and maintainers and journals really are nothing without their editorial uh, boards and, and, uh, and, uh, and authors submitting. And so, um, you know, I think this sort of evolution between different roles in the project feels very natural, especially as it feels a lot like, a lot like uh, open source projects too. Um, the second big thing that we've copied, and this is a you know, pretty explicit thing, uh, second we've copied from open source, and a lot of these uh, big communities uh, that are on GitHub now, they have bots that kind of assist them uh, in their community growth. So there's uh, tools like uh, there's GitHub's Hubot. Uh, there's also a thing called Probot. Uh, we have our bot called Whedon, of course. And the way that they work, these work is through webhooks. And so some of you might know about these. These are a kind of a really popular way of integrating different systems. This is how the uh, DOI integration uh, between GitHub and Zenodo and GitHub and Figshare works. Uh, basically, you do something on a platform, and this is 
uh, thing that GitHub does and GitLab and Bitbucket, all the platforms, major platforms do this. Um, after you do something, you, sort of an event is broadcast and then you, you know, your, your bots can, can respond. And there's uh, a very nice framework that uh, people are interested in called Probot that you can look at. And, and some of the things that communities use uh, to, again, sort of uh, um, uh, incentivize and amplify uh, the open source uh, um, best practices in their communities are there's like projects here that will uh, maintains this is a, a file called an all contributors file so if you open an issue on a project they'll add you to the contributors file in the project repository as somebody who's contributed to the community through you know inquiry and if you touch documentation then it will add you and you can add somebody for design so there's lots of different ways to recognize people's contributions uh, this is a bot that uh, will, so this is somebody testing it out, screw you bot, and the bot comes in and says that's not very nice, uh, you should read our code of conduct, so this is, you know, about uh, creating uh, a, a, a friendly, welcoming language. Um, I forget what this one, I think this this is a project to uh, invite, oh yes, anybody who's merged a pull request, like I said with the Node community earlier, uh, you can invite them to your organization as a maintainer. Um, uh, this one I rather like, and actually the AstroPry uses this. Uh, so when somebody says, oh, this looks really easy, uh, the bot says, do you really mean easy? Maybe you mean straightforward, or maybe we should think more about that. And so just, you know, just uh, uh, sometimes people who are very experienced with code bases will say easy when they, it's easy for them, but maybe not other people. And again, uh, uh, people looking at trying to uh, uh, help our, um, our people, onboard people into communities. So issues for good first, uh, uh, for first timers. So just wrapping up, I just want to kind of speculate a little bit on what kind of journal have we built with Joss. Um, there's a really excellent paper that I'd encourage you to read that kind of takes a broad look at all the different ways in which peer review uh, is implemented. And I, and, and I definitely some of these uh, uh, classifications um, uh, resonate. And so I definitely think we're in the sort of collaborative uh, space. I think we, you know, we do have iterative transparent review. Um, sometimes it can be. Uh, additionally time consuming there's uh, I think all of these things are, 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 are good observations also the you know we are definitely in this pre-publication open peer review authors uh, you know don't have any option but to sign their reviews everybody knows who everybody is in the system I also wanted to make some observations just on how it's going you know it seems to be working um, people enjoy editing reviewing and being reviewed at Joss um, uh, and you know so this is one of our editors saying that he likes the fact that he can just work on his iPhone because it's on GitHub. Um, you know, this is one of our authors enjoying. Uh, uh, one of our authors enjoying the um, uh, the uh, uh, the review process again. Uh, somebody comparing it to like a seminar, and actually, you kind of know what's happening because everybody's in there, and and it's kind of intense. But then when it's done, it's really done. Um, yeah. So here's uh, here's a particular favorite. Um, the other thing is that people generally like the robot. As I said earlier, um, some people are kind of confused that there's a robot hanging out in the review process. So this does cause confusion, but generally, uh, generally it works pretty well. Um, and honestly, the, 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 the kind of challenges that we have, it turns out, uh, running a journal are, are really, I think, pretty similar to challenges that other journals have. And they're mostly about scaling people processes. So, you know, uh, having editors not um, um, spend too much time uh, assigning papers, making sure there are enough editors for the throughput. Um, you know, we're, I think, in, uh, thinking about instigating term limits for editors just because ultimately people do burn out sometimes uh, and we don't want people to leave uh, uh, frustrated with the project. And when there's some technology improvements we can make to... Um, so some unexpected consequences of uh, working openly. I think semi-regular emails from people shouting at me because I haven't asked them to review yet is probably my biggest surprise. Uh, this is uh, always surprising to me. Um, we generally get people accepting to review very quickly. Um, and we have one problem which uh, we have to watch out for when we've got a very high profile author. So this recently happened for um, a package written by Hadley Wickham. Uh, some of you will know Hadley, he's written a lot of very high quality R packages. Um, you know, everybody wants to review that submission and people watch the repository and the people are like, I'd like to review this. And you know, it's not really fair to have 10 reviews for a package to the author. So. Um, some really awesome things about working openly, there's zero privileged information in the system. So reviewers, editors, uh, authors all know what the state of a paper is. And that has some very nice consequences for increased transparency. Um, 
this is also bad. Um, um, just because you know that a review has just come in as an author doesn't mean that you should uh, 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 now chase the editor to work on your paper like five seconds later. So the zero privileged information means that everybody knows exactly what's happening at the, any point in time and this can actually lead to some bad behavior occasionally. This is pretty rare. Um, I would also say like any open source project, there are some potential cultural barriers to working like this. And I think as have been uh, discussed by others, potentially negative dynamics for junior staff. Um, so just wrapping up, you know, Joss, I feel is, you know, fundamentally we're trying to build an environment where peer review feels like a collaboration between authors, reviewers, and editors. And one of the amazing things about going to the Open Publishing Awards last night is to just see that, you know, the amazing uh, 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 diversity in, in open source projects, open access projects, open data projects uh, throughout scholarly infrastructure. There's a really nice recent paper that kind of argues that, you know, there's this opportunity to transform scholarly communications and flip to open source. And, you know, I think when it's at its best, open source is open, collaborative, and reproducible. And that's kind of how I want academia and scholarly commons to be too. So thanks. Okay, I think we are going to wrap up there, but Arfan, you, are you joining us for drinks? Definitely. Really do? Yeah. So there you go. You can find Arfan over, uh, ask him a question in a more relaxed environment. I think really do. Yeah. And so remember, thank you very much, everyone. So we're going to take the tram, I think, mostly. It's very direct, two stops just outside, and there's going to be people outside helping you get that way if you haven't taken it before. Cool. So see you there. Thank you. Sorry. I, yeah. yeah, I was I, I was a bit worried about twenty minutes in, I was like But yeah. I'm starting to go a bit faster. Oh we do? Oh you do? Thank you so much. Yes. My wife is oh yeah. Actually I'm gonna have to give these to my kids. They love these.